Consortium. I am Martin Ramsey, the Managing Director of the LAMP Consortium, um, and I'll be acting as your moderator today. But today is a special time because we are actually doing this jointly with the Sakai Virtual Conference. So uh, there are a lot of folks who are on the call today who are part of the Sakai Virtual Conference that's going on all day. And because these two uh, events overlapped in the same time, Wilma Hodges graciously agreed to a crossover event. So welcome everyone. I'm just really glad that you're here. I need to say just a little bit about uh, what LAMP is so that you will um, sort of understand. Those of you who are with the Sakai Virtual Conference will understand who these other folks are that have joined in. Um, the LAMP Consortium is a group of colleges and other educational organizations that band together to share technology for teaching and learning. Um, you can find out more about, our, about us at our website, lampconsortium.org. Um, by working together, frankly, uh, we're able to provide world-class services at a greatly re reduced cost. And we share the number one learning management system in the world, Sakai. And to those of you who are with the Sakai Virtual Conference, you don't need me to tell you that, um, but other folks may need to know. Um, as well as many other technologies that support teaching and learning, we also provide uh, educational opportunities for our collaborative community and beyond, including events like this webinar. So for those of you who don't know, these webinars are offered free on the second Thursday of each month at the same time, just now. Um, and I'll tell you how you can get in touch with us at the end of the webinar if you would like to do that. Um, I do need to make just a few housekeeping type announcements. Um, we always do this each time. Um, first, I, I wanna again, welcome the Sakai Virtual Conference to this uh, webinar. It's really great that our two communities can overlap like this. And uh, the Sakai Virtual Conference attendees will get a little peek into the world of the LAMP Learning Consortium. And probably even more importantly, members of the LAMP community will come to know that there is this active and robust community of Sakai users and developers all over the world. We just got out of a session where we had lots of presentations out of South Africa. Um, just it underscored again how worldwide Sakai is. So we are recording these webinars. Um, it's our intention to make them available for review once we get the video file processed. And uh, we do encourage discussion during these webinars um, and the panelists will be glad to take your questions. Just type them into the Zoom chat window and we'll get to them as we can. Uh, we do encourage you to keep your microphone muted uh, to minimize background noise and distractions. And we also prefer, frankly, that you leave your camera off because that can also minimize uh, distractions. Um, I will say that's not the case with the presenters, but um, with everybody else. So uh, with that said, uh, let me um, introduce our panelists. All three are longtime Sakai users at institutions that have been members of the LAMP Learning Consortium for many years. Carol Brickey currently serves as uh, Kentucky Christian University at, as the Dean of Nursing. Carol launched the first fully online degree program at KCU in 2012, followed by a fully online uh, MSN Family Nurse Practitioner program in 2015. Her doctoral work completed at uh, Frontier Nursing University focused on student engagement and academic persistence among distance learners. Darwin Glassford is the Director of Online Learning and program, Graduate Program Director. He is widely regarded among the LAMP Consortium community as someone who can always be relied on to have an engaging experiential activity up his sleeve. More than once I've seen him pull something out of his pocket and suddenly, boom, he had us all. Darwin holds degrees from Montreat Anderson College, Taylor University, Wheaton, Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, Marquette University, and Covenant Theological Seminary. He obviously has a hard time settling down. Um, <laughs> And finally, Terry Ann Smith is the Associate Dean of Institutional Assessment and an Associate Professor of Biblical Studies at New Brunswick Theological Seminary. She oversees the assessment of the institution's degree programs, as well as being known as the LAMP Consortium Community. Um, she's someone who cares about her students. She always comes across as this real compassionate person. Terry's undergraduate degree from Roosevelt University in Information Systems, while she also holds a Master's in Divinity from New Brunswick Theological Seminary and a doctorate from Drew University. So, with that all said, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that we can basically just see each other um, and, and, and take a look and chat and all that sort of thing. Um, but, uh, oh, it says you can't start your video because the host has stopped it. I don't know what that means, but that's okay. <laughs> so I wanna make sure I'll, that- Yeah, I'll check on that. It's, it's some weird setting in Zoom. I'll, I'll take care of it. Okay, no so, problem. <laughs> So do you um, want me to try to undo my camera again? I think you're okay, Terry. I mean, we'll, we'll... All right, you should be able to turn your cameras on now. Okay, there we go. Yep. Okay. There we go. Good. Okay, there we go. There's some familiar faces to me. Okay, excellent. So um, 
my job is to sort of moderate this discussion and, and give us a chance to um, think about what, what each other thinks. Um, so let's start with a really, really basic question, a fundamental question. Uh, to what degree does social engagement play a role in teaching and learning? And I'm, I'm hoping that this is gonna be a free flowing conversation between the three panelists, um, but just to get things started, Terry Ann, perhaps I can start with you. What role does social engagement play in teaching and learning for you? Okay, so so I, I think that social social engagement is essential, first of all, overall to the learning process, uh, but specifically significant when we're talking in this sort of uh, online learning environment. Um, student, students need space where they can interact and learn from each other. And it, so it also provides opportunities for students to collectively make meaning out of what they're receiving. And that goes beyond just listening to lectures or PowerPoints or written assignments. And so when, when students are interacting with their peers, uh, they collectively participate and share those learnings, which requires them to process and contextualize and articulate those learnings, which in turn, at least uh, for, for how I'm understanding it, in turn, it creates uh, spaces. It creates spaces uh, for them to dialogue with one another. So um, it, to, for them to dialogue with one another, which I, I think is a really important way that uh, people learn. Um, and not to mention that students want to be able to connect with other students. Uh, they, they find that extremely uh, important. So, okay, so we gotta um, we gotta remember this idea of dialogue and connecting uh, as we as we go through this. All yes. right, so and that's I was gonna add to that as well. You know, my research that I completed for my doctoral work really looked at retention of students, and one of the the things that came out of that is the more connected that the students feel to other students mm -hmm. and to the faculty, that the more likely they are to persist in whatever program they are they're in, whether that's as an on-campus student or as a distance learner. Okay, and so now, now I, with some trepidation, I, um, utter the single word Darwin, <laughs> and, <laughs> and I wait to see what happens. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so great, great question. Love the question. Um, it's kind of interesting in in my history, um, loving school, um, continuing to take um, online classes. I will leave all institutions unnamed in this presentation. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> um, but one of the most interesting things to me has been what is the educational philosophy of the instructor? So when I've taken online courses and I'll speak specifically to those, um, where the instructor has seen um, the role of the course as delivery of content, um, the social interaction has generally been non-existent and what social interaction is um, between students is to survive. Um, on the other hand, when we talk about social engagement, if we see the educational process as one that mentors students into a discipline or a field of study. So, so it's using a, a mentoring model rather than a content delivery model, then that social aspect um, begins to play a much more important role because it's not only about the content then, it becomes about the character. It becomes how do you collaborate in this field of study? Um, how do you go about um, addressing those issues? And, um, and so I think a lot of it goes back to what do you envision happening in the classroom? Um, and what do you envision happening into this online environment? And then asking, how do I facilitate that? Because it's just not gonna naturally happen. So, so Darwin, um, let's go back to March of 2020. It's, okay. it, it, there, there will be times when uh, 20 years from now, if I'm still alive, um, we will say things like, well, you remember March of 2020. It was, it was a, an important time because everybody and his brother who was teaching school had to suddenly switch to online. Um, yeah. And it was a time of chaos for many beautiful. people. It was beautiful, beautiful chaos. <laughs> okay, so so I mean, so all three of you have talked about a model um, that that's important, and so um, well, well, I hesitate uh, to ask this. So, Go ahead, Terry. So, so for for me, for me, when I think about particularly in an online learning environment, 
uh, in terms of social action. The question is, how do I create community? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so the, the idea of uh, bringing, bringing students into this environment and then trying to creatively, creatively think about what would community now look like uh, on, in, in an online virtual, in this virtual space? How, what does community now look like? Mm -hmm. it is, is what I, is, for me, is how I approach that, that question of social, social interaction and social engagement. So I think one of the things that, you know, happened in March, um, you know, there's a difference in teaching students who signed up for a distance education program mm -hmm. and students who were in the classroom and that's what they signed up for and then they transition online. And I think it's important, you know, one of the things that we were careful here about is thinking about that experience from going in the classroom, it's very interactive to being online can be very isolating if we're not intentional about encouraging those interactions between faculty and students and between students. And also keeping in mind that those students weren't very well prepared to make that transition. They don't know a lot about how to use the tools in the course site. Um, and so being very thoughtful about how we create a supportive learning environment for them and help them make that transition into using that technology um, was, it was really important when we made that transition. So maybe it's time to ask a, a real practical question. Each of you take a turn at this. How did you do that? How did you go about deliberately creating community? Because it sounds like that's a common theme. So Carol, how'd you, how'd you go about doing that? Well, um, we actually, first thing we did was making sure that they all knew how to use um, the, the classroom, right? Like how do you use the tools mm -hmm. um, in the site? You know, my online students are well versed in that, but our students that were used to being in class, they may or may not have known how to use those tools. And so um, a very structured introduction of those tools. So not throwing them all at them at one time, but saying, this is how we use this tool. Okay, now you've got this one mastered, let's use this one. Um, and then coming up with very creative and interactive assignments so that we were mm -hmm. encouraging them to interact with one another. Um, and, you know, I, I can share all kinds of examples of things that we did, um, but, you know, just being intentional instead of just throwing up a forum and having them discuss, we would have live sessions where they could interact with the faculty. We would record things if they weren't able to join in. We would have one-on-one -on -one sessions with faculty, group projects where they would work together and, des and design things and present them. Um, we also, you know, we're a nursing program, so we also had to get really creative with our students who we're supposed to be in a hospital setting learning and taking care of patients. Well, what does that look like when I'm now a virtual learner or not in a hospital? And yeah. so we had to get pretty creative with um, how are we gonna cover those clinical experiences? And we, and we were able to do that by um, some unfolding case studies, faculty were role-playing patients and, and, in, and, and nurses were logging in and our students were logging in and interviewing those, us as the patient. Um, so just being creative and, and encouraging that interaction. So we'll, we'll come back for us in a little bit and ask about some more specific details because I, I think that it's wonderful to have real examples of this. But Terry Ann, you were about to say something. And then we'll go I, to I, was gonna, I was going to chime in with Carol in terms of, first of all, familiarizing students with, with the tools. And so uh, in terms of how we were being creative about tools, what you between uh, the lessons pages where students are able to go in and build their own lessons and collaborate uh, using a uh, big blue button and, and with study groups. And so it was just, it was just giving them more, more knowledge of not just the tools, but mm -hmm. how to use the tools where they could then go off and then create their own opportunities to study together. Oh, uh, okay. Darwin, you want to take a tackle yeah. at this? And I've got a question. I think, yeah. It was, it, I mean, I would, I would describe um, our experience and even my experience in the class I was teaching at the time as kind of, um, yeah, beautiful chaos. Because um, it, it really was trying to pull together multiple tools um, to bring faculty along. Um, and I would say that we were highly adaptable. Um, we had to be adaptable. We were already working with a mental model with our students um, in a more traditional setting, supplemented by online to moving fully online. And um, one of the things that that we really encouraged and, and found um, is that we had to relay those expectations to students. Um, so for example, in, in small group um, work, 
um, rather than just saying, uh, okay, you guys need to do this, um, we had to have them come back to us and say, is so-and-so there? Are they missing? You have to take the initiative. You have to be accountable for one another um, because we don't have that one-on-one -on -one check in um, face to face. And so in some ways, I think it's strengthened things um, because no student likes to email the professor and say, Jimmy has missed the last two sessions, but the professor needs to, the, they need to contact Jimmy and the professor needs to contact Jimmy because I think one of the biggest challenges that we faced were just students disappearing. Mm. Um, students that would not respond to email, that would ignore text, would ignore requests for video chats. Um, it's like they dropped off the face of the earth. And without that one-on-one -on -one contact, it took a lot to try to find them. And then when you finally found out what was going on, um, getting them back up to speed at a, at a reasonable pace was, was really a challenge. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and Martin, one of the things that helped us is that we were already doing hybrid classes. Right. Mm -hmm. We were already, uh, so our students were already very, very, very familiar and for most of them very comfortable uh, moving back and forth into the in, uh, online environment. Now for our, our faculty uh, who weren't uh, necessarily teaching hybrids, mm -hmm. uh, because we, we, you know, we, we had a choice. You could either do hybrid classes or you could do face-to-face -face classes. And so we had a few faculty who had to up their learning curve, uh, mm -hmm. not just on, and, and, and realizing that there is a, a distinct difference between uh, having your syllabi uh, ready to go for a face-to-face -face class and then trying to convert that syllabi for an online learning environment, which is entirely, it, it's more than just putting up the syllabi and saying, here, now just do all of these things. And yeah. so uh, we, yeah. we did have to, to uh, help our faculty uh, again wrap their, their arms around what this community look like so, in this new environment. I think one of, the helpful, one of the helpful things to remember is that when we, in March, we had to adapt. Okay, when it came to fall with my faculty and stuff, um, I took a little different tactic. Um, usually when I work with faculty, help them bring a course online, um, what I do is I have them come in and I meet with them and I have them bring their course syllabus. And, and I have a shredder in my office. And I say, this is how we're going to start. And I literally just shred their syllabus in front of them. And I That's say, fierce. you know the content. You know the content. Here's the end. Now, how are we going to get there? What's important? Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, as we moved into the fall, and it's been a challenge, it always will be, is what is the kind of the nature of community that you want to create in this class? Mm -hmm. And what is the path that you're going to use to, to get there to facilitate that. And it's going to be a different class if you don't have a different strategy, if you don't have face-to-face -face interaction. Um, and usually then they look at me with that befuddled look like, I can't believe you just shredded my syllabus. Um, I can't believe we're starting over. Um, and then I just start saying, imagine, start thinking differently. And, and over time, ideas start to percolate that they have about how to do this. And then I can give them the tools and help them learn the tools to accomplish that. Yeah, we've got a tool that'll do that. Um, right. But, but it, yeah, okay. So let me, uh, there's a question from Dee Dee Hurricane in, in, the, in the chat. Uh, any concrete recommendations on how to build that trust with faculty and an institution in order to foster the, that relationship to help students complete their education? So you know, it, it's a, it's sort of a sidebar of, of building trust, but Terry Ann, you said community, communities don't build without trust, right? So how do you go about doing that? With faculty, with, what we've done with, with, with faculty in terms of building that trust is um, not, number one, we really did put a lot of effort into helping faculty uh, throughout that process while they were building their online courses making all kinds of help available. Uh, even even uh, some of our faculty, it, it's available to all of the faculty where they can go in and uh, sign up to do some, some instructional design courses and which mm -hmm. Dean will, will pay for that for our, for our faculty to at least 
get their feet wet, to get comfortable with it. We partner with each other in, in terms of our faculty colloquies where we're helping each other. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I allow, since, since I'm one of, the, one of the ones who they do kind of sort of think I might know something, I don't know why, uh, but, <laughs> but but I, I do I do uh, place them in my courses and put put you know when faculty want to get a, a sense of what a course might look like if they've never done that before they can uh, have access to my courses and then you know ask questions and they and that gets all done even before the course is released to the student and so. Uh, so a couple of things. So uh, to build that trust is to first get faculty comfortable mm -hmm. with uh, being and, and doing some instructional design kind of work. Um, so the, the, the trust starts among uh, us as peers right. uh, and, and being willing to share uh, our learnings. That, that's where we start to be okay. able to share our learnings. And that's very sure. similar to what we did at Kentucky Christian. You know, we have probably like most schools, a wide range of faculty. We have people who are Sakai super users who use all the tools and are very comfortable in designing their classes and, and all of those. And we have faculty who didn't really even use the course site or shell for anything, not the grade book, syllabus, nothing. And so for us, it was about creating that safe environment for those faculty to come and say, you know, I'm an expert in my area where I teach, but this online is new to me. And, and really, you know, just allowing them to kind of talk through this is what we do in this class this is what this class is about helping them kind of come up with creative ideas again showing them, you know, I, I showed people things that we did in it like in my class or what we do in my department. Um, in nursing, we also have the a wide range we have people who teach completely remote We have people who do some hybrid and we have people who are dead, you know, very much dedicated to teaching in the classroom and so we got together as a faculty and kind of talked through, okay, what are we going to do with clinical? What does that look like now? And just, just had some creative sessions where it was safe to just throw out their ideas. And then I would help them try to help find tools that they could use within Sakai to be able to carry out those assignments. Well, that's and kind of an, them. an approach like Darwin was talking about is start with the, start with the end in mind, what you want to accomplish. And then, oh yes, we've got a tool for that rather than saying you ought to use this tool. That's, right. uh, that's good. So, so let me, I, I found Go ahead, the was that responding to faculty's request for help promptly is, is really critical. Mm -hmm. um, whether that's video, whether it's sending them a text, whether it's going to their homes and helping them plow through something, um, that responsiveness um, brings down the anxiety level. Um, I also gave one of my faculty this summer a award um, that I give out randomly, and it's called uh, Crash the Sakai Reward. Oh. <laughs> And, um, and one of my faculty members was attempting to do something and posted a link. So another whole podcast website got read into Sakai and it crashed the whole thing, um, the whole site. And I, so we fixed it. And then I gave him an award um, because he was showing initiative and creativity and trying something. And so um, when they crash it, because they're trying to do something new and different, I reward them for that. There you go. Okay. All right. So, so. I, this, I'm going to ask the next question, which to me is the one I really want to get to. And that is, I want to hear some of the concrete things that you all did. Carol, for example, you, you alluded to it earlier. You know, we, we did some creative things. So what did you do? Because I'm hoping that people who are on this call will come away going, oh, that's a good idea. You know, if, if they walk away with two or three good ideas from y'all, I think it'll be a, an hour well spent. So Carol, what? Sure. give me give me at least one. <laughs> and so, then we'll, we'll go around the room several times. Yeah, so one of the things that we we had to deal with that maybe was unique to uh, to those of you who have nursing programs or, or programs that have uh, preceptorships or internships or things like that was how do we meet those outcomes? How do we get those hours in, in a way that's gonna be meaningful for the students and meet those outcomes? And so one of those is how do we replace clinical virtually? How do we do that? Um, and we had tools from you know, other programs that we use that we could draw in, but we also wanted those students to have that interaction with faculty and not just completing virtual simulated experiences. So we would have um, live sessions with the students where we would pose as the patient and we would have um, 
uh, you know, kind of a script that we would go by and the students would interview us. They would do a kind of assessment. Really, if, if you think about telehealth, if any of you have participated in a telehealth type visit during this period of COVID, it was very much structured like that. And so it gave us an opportunity for the student to practice their skills. Um, but it, then it also provided an opportunity for immediate and meaningful feedback because then at the end of the of the scenario, we could talk to that student and say, you know, you did this really great, but maybe next time think about this, or did you think about, you know, did you think about asking these questions, or what about this type of intervention? And so students really, they were intimidated by it before they did it, but the feedback that we got from students following that was very positive. They all very much enjoyed it, so they learned a lot from it, and they liked it better than the virtual simulations that they did. So that's one example um, of something that we did. And I've got others, but I'll allow you guys to share your yeah, examples Yeah, we'll, we'll go too. around. So save, yeah. save one. Um, who wants to be next? Darwin, Terry Ann, who wants to tackle it? Uh, go ahead, Terry. Um, well, my, mine's is a lot different from Carol's. Sure, uh, exactly. That's what uh, we're looking because for. Because I like, uh, you know, the, I, I do a class on biblical research and writing. And so it's, it's learning the tools of research. Um, but also analyzing biblical texts. And, and, and I've noticed after teaching this class for several years that students, but by the time we get to the end of the semester are, are really stressed. They have to create this, this, this exegetical paper and, and that's supposed to be their final. And so what I, what I did uh, when we went online is I, I set up uh, at the very beginning, uh, students knew at the end of the semester they would be playing Jeopardy. So they were given they were given the categories, and the categories uh, were content. This is all coming out of the the, the, the content of the course, um, the the tools used for analysis in the course. So that the categories were all set, and they were given to the students, and they would form their own, and they had to form their own teams. Mm. So uh, once their teams were formed, they went off with the categories and they studied. They, they formed their own study groups in Sakai. In Sakai, they used big blue button to host those meetings, those study group meetings. So they're off doing all of this interaction uh, uh, so that they're getting ready for this game that happens on the last day of class. And it's a Jeopardy board. It has the categories, it has all of the numbers and the questions and even the Jeopardy music and the bell. So, so that the students, so they, so throughout the semester they've studied. So it, it gives them, it gives them an opportunity to sort of showcase, uh, not to, at first, you know, they always like, oh, we're going to play a game. But at the end, they find that not only the studying, getting prepared for the game, uh, they are learning the content. They're still having to write the paper. And I am just amazed at how competitive they get <laughs> at, the, at the end when, you, when, you're, when, when they're in their teams. Mm -hmm. uh, and they hold each other accountable for being able to, to respond uh, in those categories that they've studied. So it, it was just one of the ways that at the end of the semester, it takes off a lot of stress. Uh, what do they get out of, out of that? They still have to write a paper. Uh, the winning team gets extra points uh, added up for the, the, the team that wins gets extra points that also go towards their grade. So, uh, and it, it brings them, it allows them a little bit more interaction than, than that they would normally get in this kind of environment. So Terry Ann, did you, how did you play the Jeopardy game given the COVID restrictions? Did you do it with Big Blue Button? I, we did it with Big Blue Button. Okay. Uh, and again, the screen sharing. So I was able to create my Jeopardy board with all of the categories. Yeah. Uh, so we're screen sharing. Uh, students are able to buzz in. I found a buzzer, a okay. virtual buzzer. Okay. That Whoever buzzes first, it locks them in. Uh, their team member gets to answer the question. Uh, and, and we go on the way the, the, the game would normally go in if we were playing. Huh. Okay, Jeopardy. that's cool. <laughs> uh, so uh, what, what, right. what, the competitiveness was amazing, but how they held each other accountable 
for uh, the study times that they had together. So they they determined who was gonna who was gonna study which which uh, category, who mm-hmm. was gonna be responsible for answering questions. They figured that all out for themselves in their in their uh, study groups. And there's some incredible cognitive skills that they're learning there that perhaps have nothing to do with exegetical research, but um, are still really important for living. So good, that's good. All right, Darwin, give give us one. Give us something that you've done that's innovative. Probably not super innovative, um, but try to work with um, my faculty and myself um, to create um, a happy hour or something weekly where students can um, check in Um, and have conversations. Um, We found that if we use the term office hours, it didn't go very well. Um, So um, happy hour, and um, at least when I did it, I had happy hour and you got a free beverage, um, which was an additional two points added to your, um, to an assignment grade. So (laughs) there was a reward there and um, had no expectation for how long they'd hang out, Um, but invite them into the happy hour. How's it going? Um, probably shouldn't use the imagery of a pub, but um, the imagery of a pub, just trying to have a conversation among people about how you're doing, how's it going. Um, not always entirely focused on the class, though it often went there, um, but trying to create a venue where um, students felt comfortable sharing um, with each other and with the professor. So, so again, that idea of building a community and building the so, trust. The idea of, being a, you know, how, hey, how's this class going for you? And how are your other classes going online? Well, I submitted, you know, I'm sending stuff to my professor and the professor's not responding. You know, and I'm like, okay, that's good. That's really good to know. Um, because one of the things that we did find out through the COVID-19 thing um, was that we had to send um, assignment information and expectations um, and reminders to students um, ad nauseum um, that they would just, if, it, if we didn't send reminders, even though there was a syllab- an assignment in the calendar, an assignment on the syllabus, an assignment in their calendar, it, it wouldn't happen. Um, and so we just had to continually contact them. And yeah. for me, the, the office hour and part of my happy hour that I ran was just Sakai. What questions do you have about Sakai? And all the students were invited. Um, I'd let faculty know who were attendant to give them a reward. Um, if I'd had a box full of Sakai girls, I would have given them out to those. Um, <laughs> Dr. Check up. could probably help you with that. <laughs> um, he lives fairly nearby you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he does, not about an hour away. Um, but just, just, you know, how do you foster this, this sense of, of openness and availability? Yeah, cool. All right, Carol. <laughs> um, one of the other things that we did, which um, I, I really enjoyed this project, I think the students did too, um, is we uh, teach a leadership class. And so, you know, in person, part of leadership is learning how to work with other people. Um, and so we designed a, a group project. And this is something that we had done in our online programs, but we kind of um, geared it more towards the undergraduate students. But in their leadership course, they actually create. Um, uh, we, we change it up, you know, one year it was a drug rehab facility proposal for our community. One year it was like a outpatient or a inpatient hospice center. So there are different things that we did, but we form groups with the students and they actually research, they do a needs assessment. They um, kind of design the facility. They develop a project budget. So we're hitting all of those real important content areas within nursing leadership. They write policies for the facility. And then we have a group of mock community leaders who they present their proposal to. Um, and the really neat thing about this project is, is they have to learn to use the collaboration tools within Sakai. So they use wikis to create these documents. Um, we're a Google campus, so they use Google Slides to, to develop their presentation. And then they presented it to you know community leaders, which were actually faculty um, or other people in the university who would participate. Um, but it also pulled in, I think this is an important point when you're thinking about students who are used to that community of being on campus and the availability of resources is how can you draw in those support services to keep those students connected to those? And so one of the important points of contact for us, for our students is the library. 
Um, they do lots of evidence-based practice projects. Um, almost every assignment requires them to have a scholarly evidence to show you know, their rationale for what they're doing. And so we actually were able to incorporate um, lab, a meeting with the librarian um, into that assignment so that those students were um, had help with search, key search terms, using the library, the databases, um, because they can't just walk into the library during COVID and get help finding their articles. And so integrating that into that project was really helpful and it helped those students stay connected to those really important resources. Um, I'm just looking at, 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 a, at, at I mean, I, I love that. I mean, oh, I, let me ask you a question that was on my mind and then I wanna go to this question that came in the chat. Um, Carol, you said um, that you put group students in teams. So I think Terry said that she let them self-select into the Jeopardy teams. Did you deliberately place them into teams? We did because of the personalities of the students. We kind of wanted to create that, what it's like in the real world. Um, now in our online programs, we don't, we allow them to self-select, but um, within that dynamic of that class, um, we knew that if we paired certain groups together, it probably wasn't going to turn out for the best for anyone. So oh. we did select those teams, um, but it just kind of depends on the student group that we're working with, whether we okay. pick the teams or allow them to select. All right, fair enough. Okay, so Tonko says, uh, making theoretical courses more meaningful online during COVID, we've turned to taping hospitality professionals in the respective domain taught with assignment questions linked to real life current day cases from within that domain that it relates to the hospitality industry. In other words, marketing, operations, management, human resources, and so forth. So in other words, it's real um, real stuff. Do you all, does that make sense to you all? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, go ahead, Darwin, you're about to say hey, something. I mean, I would say, he, I think he's on the right track. I'm just sorry that it took COVID-19 to get there. Yeah, okay, fair enough. <laughs> okay, so yeah, and, again, enough. I suspect it was, it was moving in that direction. Um, but, but how do you take kind of, and he's right, how do you take real life situations? Um, I'll, I'll pick on, on Terry. Um, how do you, how do you pick on a, how do you give students an example of like really bad exegesis and let them tear it apart and realize why it's really bad exegesis? Um, that, and, that for, or, or a good sermon, you could put Paula White up there in front of Donald Trump and, um, <laughs> Like, what do we do with this exegetically? Uh, well, with, <laughs> Go ahead, with, Terry. <laughs> well, uh, a, a couple, a, a, a couple, of, a couple of things. So, so uh, it, again, because the way this course is structured, it, it's done in building blocks, uh, and the right. students at the end, uh, the 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 game is the last day of class. But before we get to that date. Uh, students have to take their paper, the exegetical paper that they create, and they have to turn it into something for practical use. Oh, good. So, so uh, they are either presenting a sermon, a Bible study, uh, yeah. or, or something that they can actually use that then other students weigh in on. So that mm -hmm. presentation, that presentation that they're giving before we get to the end of the semester, yeah. Then uh, there's a rubric that's given out for, for students to um, sort of weigh in on what their peers are, are saying and, or doing and, and then having discussions about the, what did they like, what didn't they like, what, what, what could they add? So that, that becomes that conversation. Uh, I, right. I, I do give them an example of what I think a good exegetical paper looks like, uh, but I can guarantee you <laughs> that, that by the time we, when they're doing their presentations, um, so some will be very, very good and some will be questionable, uh, but the feedback that they get are not just from, from me as the professor, they're also getting feedback from their peers. Yeah, so, I mean, I think you're, I mean, the, the key point there is, is um, I appreciate is, is in the theoretical um, or even in the applied, um, when are we asking the so what question? Mm -hmm. and, and when in a, in a really concrete sort of way are, are we asking um, the students that we're mentoring um, to, to actually show us that they can do the so what? Mm -hmm. And then, and then what, what's the feedback loop that we're giving them um, that encourage that helps them to see 
Um, this is what they did well. This is where they need to grow. This is the challenges they face. Um, how are we filling that feedback loop so learning continues? Um, and, and so often I think what happens is that we get to the end of a course and whether it's online or in person, we assign a grade and we think it's over. Mm -hmm. uh, but that conversation, again, if we're building community, that conversation in the class, that conversation with um, students one-on-one -on -one that says, hey, um, this is the strong suits. Here are the challenges. Here are some things that I see. Here's some things you really actually need to wrestle with um, as you move to the future. Mm -hmm. um, and those kind of hard conversations, I actually think is where most of the learning takes place beyond content. Yeah, because it becomes much more formative at that point. So quick, quick practical question. Rob has asked, how big are your teams? Carol, how big were your teams that you were putting together? So it depends on, you know, depending on the course and what we're doing and the number of students in the course. But for that particular project, the other thing we factor in is, is it a full semester course? Is it a modular course? You know, how long do they have right. to gather all this information? But for that particular course, we would have groups of four to five. Okay. So, I mean, my sense is, because I work with groups all the time, my sense is there's a point at which the group is too large. And yeah, there's a point at which it's too small too. Correct. Um, and I, I just kind of look at what's the outcome for this project and is there enough work for them to share to where everybody has the responsibility in it or um, is it too small? You know, mm -hmm. so we need to have a smaller group. Um, so, so it just depends. And also, you know, sometimes we have smaller class sizes. So you have to kind of adjust, adjust the expectations for, for the project based on your class. So Terry Ann, how, how, many, how many are on uh, a Jeopardy I, team? Uh, our, our, it, it varies. So, so at the most, I might have 20, 20, 20 students, uh, which means that in some, in some cases I've done four teams. Okay. Uh, if so four I've teams of five? Some, some, yes. But then if the, 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 the number of students that are in the class are uh, smaller, like I've had as, as few as 11, Mm -hmm. uh, then it, I would, that would just be two teams. Okay. Uh, and so it, it does depend upon the, the size of the class. Yeah. All right. So you're, you're saying it depends as well. All right. So let me, let me switch gears a little bit here because Rob asked kind of a practical question. How many people on a team? That's a good question. So, so here's a question and I really appreciate where this started out. Uh, thank you all for starting with reminding us that it, it's the end that matters and you know, I much as if I were in Darwin's office and he shredded my syllabus, I would probably, <laughs> I, I would have to get out my hook. <laughs> Y'all seen my hook? This is what I used in the last session when when time was up. I had I was yeah. ready to hook people. <laughs> um, but practically speaking, now that we've established that we have to begin with the end in mind, it's about our our um, philosophy of teaching. Um, there, there's been lots of conversation about this lovely interaction between people and sort of higher order thinking. Okay, now at some point, you're using Sakai to do this. So what kind of tools are you using and in what ways? And, and now I'm being, you know, I'm being sort of crassly fundamental and, and basic. Um, be, but at some point, you know, you got to put fingers to keyboard and, and make it happen. So what, what are you using? So, so one of, one of uh, the courses that I do um, where I ask students to uh, cre create, well, two, let me just say two, uh, okay. because uh, one of the assignments is that they will lead the, they will lead the class. They will become the facilitator. Okay. And in order to do that, they have to construct a lesson. Ah. And in constructing the lesson, they have to construct that lesson in Sakai. Uh huh. Using so the lessons will, tool or not necessarily? Let you, no, we use the lessons tool. The students use the lessons tool and then they will build that lesson in Sakai. Uh -huh. uh, it becomes part of their grade in terms of being able to facilitate the class. Um, in terms of panel discussions where uh, the, there's a panel who then will lead a, a class discussion, much like what we're doing here. Sure. Um, so again, the, the content or the subject matter, the topic is already given to the panel in advance. Um, maybe a few filler questions mm -hmm. are provided to them in advance. And again, then they are to go off and then 
we're using most for the most part in the panel discussions uh big blue button okay. to to set up those meetings but in sure. terms of the facilitation and all of them having to create the plan they have to use lessons to do that okay um and let me just say as an aside to those who are not familiar big blue button is not Sakai, but it's a, it's another tool, open source tool that we in the LAMP consortium make available. And I suspect that many of you also use it as well. Um, but that when you hear us saying big blue button, that's what we mean there. So Darwin, what what about some practical um, on the ground, you know, fingers to the keyboard kind of stuff are you using within Sakai? Um, we, I mean, lessons and wiki and, and announcements, very similar to what, what Terry is doing. Um, one of the things that I've tried to impress upon my faculty um, is that students and learning these tools, when as students are learning these tools, um, they're being mentored into the professional world. Mm. Um, and so that the tool itself, like learning to use Big Blue Button or Google Meet or Zoom or whatever, um, is, is learning how to function in the professional world um, that they're gonna be entering. Mm -hmm. So that, that extends beyond Sakai, um, we're a Google campus, um, you know, how do you use Google Chat, how do you use Google Meet, you know, how do you use all these tools that are invested there um, effectively in your class, and how do you use them with students. Um, and so, that's, that's been an interesting discussion both with faculty and with students. Yeah, I mean, I can, I can see that being resented in some regards. Um, but there's another part that says, hey, I'm trying to prepare you for life and it's out there. You got to learn how to use tools like this. So let's get on with it. Right, right. So, yeah, I mean, that's that's basically it. And um, and that once you learn facility with one set of tools, it's easier to lose. The learn next ones are others. easier. Yeah. You know, yeah. So even with my faculty um, using um, the Sugi tool, yeah, Chuck, um, <laughs> to, to embed good. questions in a YouTube video. Um, when, when we started using that tool a little bit and I introduced it because a professor had a question on how to do that, mm -hmm. they will show them and it's kind of radiated. Um, and now that professor is the one that has to answer all the questions about it um, <laughs> because, because he's learned. Yeah, right. Um, and, and so then, you know, it's like, okay, you're giving a presentation in your class, you're using a video, helping students now to understand how to use that tool and not to be afraid of it. Um, for a generation that grew up so exposed to digital resources, I'm constantly amazed at how fearful they are of resources they don't know. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. To kind of piggyback um, on Darwin and Terry yeah. Ann, you know, a combination of the things that kind of what they're doing, we use our Google tools, Google Slides, um, um, documents and things like that for an assignment where they present a case scenario and they one of the things in nursing we have to learn the guidelines and how you treat these things what's expected and so they create a presentation and then we go into big blue button and they practice they present it like they're presenting at a conference and so they're learning those professional skills they're learning how to use those tools but they're also helping their peers review content that's very important um, so that's one thing and then big blue button also we use a lot we use the lessons tool um, and one thing I would say about the lessons tool that's helpful is the more courses across your curriculum across your program and even across your um, campus, if you can do that, the more that the things look the same and students find things in the same places, mm -hmm. the, the more comfortable they're gonna be mm -hmm. um, and the less stressed they're gonna be about finding those things. But another great feature of Big Blue Button is the breakout sessions. And we do a lot of active learning and group discussions during live sessions and that breakout tool within Big Blue Button, we use that a lot and, it's, and the students really enjoy that. Very good. Uh, you all weren't on the conversation just before this one that was part of the Sakai virtual conference, but particularly some ladies out of South Africa were saying design is critical. And what you just said, Carol, yeah. makes me think about, you know, a good design of, of a course at our institution, it looks like this, and we replicate that again and again and again. Right. Uh, that's, there's, there's a lot to be said for that. So yeah, I'm spending yeah. some time. I mean, we, about that. we moved there and got, we got pushed back in the beginning from, from faculty. Um, but when we shared student responses and said, look, students want to know how things are structured and where to find things. They want things labeled a certain way that allows them to navigate. Once we explained all that to them and showed them some of the data we'd accumulated, 
um, it was a pretty easy sell. Huh. Um, the, the key there for us again was when we transitioned to that from our um, kind of early adopters who kind of did whatever they wanted, um, I took on responsibility for helping them migrate to the new format. Mm. So for there were a couple of professors that I just did all, I just migrated everything for them. Uh -huh. um, and again, at, at that point, my motto with them is, I want you to use Sakai as a tool. I don't want you to be frustrated by it. Yeah. So if you're getting frustrated, I will help. Sometimes I'll say, let me do it. I can do it and really quickly. Yeah. Um, and other times I will say to you, let me show you how to do it. Um, in all cases, I always come back to them and double check with them. Um, but a lot of that, my response depends on the time frame that we're working with. You know, when a professor calls me at 10 o'clock at night and says, I need my test up. Um, I'm having trouble with my test for nine o'clock tomorrow morning. I'm not going to try to coach him on how to do a test. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, right. I'll mumble like, why are you waiting till the last minute? But, um, <laughs> you know, I'll, yes, I can, I'll take care of that for him or her. Yeah, okay. And then come back and help him understand or her understand you know, what wasn't going well for them and, and why they mm -hmm. were having trouble. Carol, I wanted to come back to something you mentioned earlier, because I think I've heard it twice now. D did I hear you say that you use the wiki tool? We do, yes. Because I don't hear about the wiki tool much in these conversations, and yet I suspected that you all were using it. It's, it's sort yes. of, it's like the unsung tool yeah. in the Sakai toolbox. Yeah. So we, we, when we, when I first started working online um, with Sakai and with the wiki tool, it was very cumbersome. It was very frustrating Still for is. students. <laughs> and so we, we kind of migrated over to Google documents, um, but it, it has, it, it's still a little bit difficult, but it's easier than it was when I first learned how to do it. And so we actually go through and what, what's frustrating for students is if you don't show them how to use the tool and then they have an assignment and they have to use it. That's very yeah, frustrating for right. students. It's not so, intuitive. Right. So we put together a really detailed tutorial for them to be able to use that. And that helps it be self-contained within the course site instead of having them to have to navigate, faculty have to navigate different places um, as we're monitoring those conversations in those, in those tools. Um, so it's, it really comes back to learn how to use the tool and then make sure your students know how to use it before they're expected. Mm -hmm. to do so yeah. okay yeah, we've we our students will use both the wiki and google docs for that and what we ask them to do is to post a shareable um a link in their wiki if they're choosing to use google docs mm -hmm. so that the faculty member just can go to the wiki and access everything in yeah. one place yeah. yeah and and tiffany just said she's at university of virginia um she just said that uh, the wiki tool is very dated and i agree completely with that but it serves a needed purpose. Right. Um, and so, you know, it's, if anything, this is kind of a plea for, you know, the, the wiki tool could, could use some attention because I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm not surprised, but in a way I am surprised because we just don't hear the wiki tool mentioned much. Yeah. Um, it's just not a, not, a, not a commonly used tool. I remember it was years ago and some people on this call may remember uh, there was a faculty member, couldn't tell you his name. He was out of Texas. He was a sociology professor and he used the wiki tool in Sakai and he assigned students groups, very similar to what Carol's talking about here, assigned student groups, a town in the United States. It was some small town that not necessarily anybody had ever been to, but you know, you're know, you gonna go to Bozeman, Montana, that's your town. And what you have to do is find out the social services there, who's what's the government like, uh, what's the demographics of the population, what's employment like, you have to find out all these things about it. And at the end of the day, that all got put into a wiki and it got built over the, over the course of the term. Um, and the professor said that that um, leaders in those towns would tell him that his students knew more about their town than anybody who lived there because they'd studied it all. And I thought that's just an impressive way to get students to collaborate uh, using a clever tool like the wiki. So I, I like that one very much. But so, okay. So did you know the median home price in Bozeman, Montana is $650,000? Is that right? Yep. Well, I guess I won't be moving to Bozeman then. I think I'll stay in Kentucky. <laughs> Although I liked Montana when I went through it, I thought it was awful pretty there. So, <laughs> um, okay. And Tiffany is also saying, and I've, I've said this before, 
um, that and I had an instructor when I was a grad student who used it to create a collaborative annotated bibliography. And that's a really good use of a, of a yeah. wiki. I've seen that done before. Terry, I interrupted you. You were about to say something. Uh, we don't, we, I, I haven't used the wiki, but I have used the blogs, have, have students create their own blogs. Mm -hmm. um, and, and some liked it, but you know, I got mixed feelings about uh, students creating their own blogs. They wanted to mm -hmm. know who was going to read them and how do you get them out there to Fair questions yeah uh, so some some gravitated toward it and um others didn't mm -hmm. yep terry ann or terry golightly is saying students can do a collaborative lesson page which is uh, another mm -hmm. yeah that's i mean so lots and lots of good ideas here and i'm looking at the clock thinking oh my goodness this conversation could just go on and on and on because there's there's so many good ideas here but i'm hoping that people on the call have gotten some some useful ideas out of this. Do you each want to throw in one last suggestion before we uh, wrap up? <laughs> no pressure, but <laughs> yeah, my, my, guess, my, my last go ahead, suggestion. Darwin. Oh, go ahead, Terry, Carol. I'm sorry. No, no. Go ahead. I Darwin, was just gonna... then Carol. Okay. Okay. I think my um, my last suggestion is, is really common sense, um, particularly as we look at um, the social distancing aspect of it and not being in the classroom. Um, and, and I'm going to admit it's a really struggle for me because I'm one of those people that you send me an appointment, don't send me a reminder. It, it's annoying. Uh -huh. um, but but I'm, we're finding and, and challenging our faculty. Um, we just have to over communicate with students. We have to over communicate again and again. I'm, I'm longing for the day and maybe coming, Wilma can answer this question. I'm longing for the day when I put an assignment in Sakai and it shows up in my students Google calendar. Uh, um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm longing for that integration. Because I think that's coming. It's, it's multiple communication channels. It's email. It's chat. It's my Google Voice um, number texting to them. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, I, is that the without the face-to-face -face interaction that most of our students are used to, um, it's so easy for them to, to lose track of yeah of things. And so, Fair point. Over communicate, right. and then when you think Good. you've over communicate, communicate some more. Good. Um, and and uh, Wilma says, we're looking at unified notifications, and I, I knew that. So, Carol, what was yours? Um, I've got a couple of things just real quick. One thing I would say is definitely know your student population and what their needs are. You know, when I'm, when I'm helping to develop a class for my traditional undergraduate students who've been transitioned online, it's, their needs are going to be a little bit different than my students who signed up for a fully online program. So yeah. you have to kind of think about that as you're developing the course. My next tip would be don't be afraid to be creative and find creative solutions. I've yet to have a faculty come to me and say, I do this in my in-seat class, but there's no way to do it online. There is a way. You have to think creatively. You have to look mm -hmm. outside the box and you have to ask for help. Go to those people who are super users of those tools and ask them, how can I make this happen? Um, and then kind of the last thing I would say is, I, it goes along with Darwin, over communicate, but also over communicate in terms of how are things going throughout mm. the class so that you could, if you need to adapt something, you don't want students to be frustrated the whole semester if it's not working for them. So ask them at different points throughout the semester, how is this going for you? Is this tool working? Do we need to adjust? Is there something else that we can do to kind of help this be more helpful for you? Yep. And you're getting some comments in the in the chat on that. That's that's good. Um, all right, Terry Ann, you want to do one last one? Um, uh, the only thing I can say is we we talked about the uh, community in terms of respect to the student. I think is is super important that that we as professors stay engaged as well. Mm -hmm. uh, that that is uh, you know students want to to be able to hear and interact with us as well. So that would be the last thing that I would say. And I, that was one of the things I wanted to say, Terry, and was when you're thinking about how, how can I do this online, always ask yourself, how can I make this interactive for that student? How can they see my face? How can they hear my voice? And how can they do that with each other? Because they're going to remain connected that way. Right. Absolutely. All right. Well, I think that I probably need to say that uh, we're, we're about out of time and that we need to, <laughs> we need to wrap it up. Um, so, I really want to thank our three panelists. I hope this has been good for the people who've been on the call. Uh, that's uh, it was kind of weird because uh, so often our our chatter is is more robust than this. But the the way it worked out with so many people, we had to basically do it with just the three panelists talking. But um, thank you for being here. 
Uh, we will notify you when the recording of this is available because I think the topic is going to be of interest to a lot of people and panelists. Again, I say this was this was really helpful. Um, I've, I've got a, a sign up that you can um, you, you can if you if you want to know about future uh, uh, sessions that we're having, I'll I'll paste it in here in just a minute. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. I actually had it copied and ready to go. There you go. You can you can click on that link and get signed up, and we'll send you notifications each month. Um, but they are uh, always on the second Thursday of the month at this time. And uh, finally, next month we've decided we're going to have a what we call the grif gift gab grab. <laughs> say that again. Gift grab bag. <laughs> um, we're we're basically going to have just you know good ideas thrown around. It'll be a time of just giving ideas and receiving ideas. And so it'll just be kind of a free for all instead of a, a more formal presentation like we usually do. So that's gonna be our December uh, session. So with that, I will say thank you very much for being here. Really appreciate everybody for being a part of the call and, and we'll end it now. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.